We're nine days out from the assassination attempt on Trump's life, and you were actually there to pray before the entire rally yeah. for Trump's safety. Yeah. I'm not the kind of person who's going to go to a political rally where there are Secret Service agents and, and shout out loud, there are people who want to shoot him. Uh, but it just kind of came out of me. It's possible that God's using him. I think the sign that he was uh, saved from a bullet w within millimeters cannot just be uh, dismissed out of hand. If that is the hand of God, then great things are expected of you. And woe to the ruler who takes that as a canonization of everything. It should be a reminder of humility and to get right with God and to submit to God's plan. Father Jason, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Lila, it's an honor. So you flew in this morning all the way from Pittsburgh. From Pittsburgh through uh, uh, Phoenix. How was that? How was the flight? You were out early. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was wonderful. Thank yeah, you. No Thanks for all. coming all the way out here. <laughs> we're nine days out from the assassination attempt on Trump's life. I want to start with that. My friend, my, one of my dearest friends, our mutual friend, texted me and said, you've got to talk to Father Jason Sharon because your perspective on what's happening in our country is so important. But let's start with the assassination attempt because you were there that day and you were actually there to pray before the entire rally yeah. for Trump's safety. Yeah, yeah. So can you share what happened? Right, so the, the the Trump campaign called me and people have asked me why did they call and I have no idea. I thought, mm -hmm. well, um, they maybe it's because I'm I'm uh, starting this pro-life shrine and they, they wanted a, a pro-life representative there. I don't know, uh, maybe because I, I rescued these orphans from Ukraine during the, the beginning of the war with Russia, when Russia invaded. Um, but why they called me, I don't know. But in any case, I uh, was able to meet with him beforehand. We talked a little bit about Ukraine and Russia. And um, um, and then, um, you know, the, the I went out and, and um, said the prayer. And uh, after that, you know, I, I uh, Secret Service let me out. And just before he was getting on the stage, I, I thought I have to get out of here before all these, <laughs> I'm, I had something, a place to be and there was no way I was going to, you know, avoid the traffic. So I, I decided to step out a little early. And uh, just before he, he took the stage, um, people in the crowd pulled me over and they said, you know, is he here? And I said, yeah, he's here. He's coming on the stage any minute now. Um, and I, I told them, you know, my, my job is done. I, I opened it with a prayer and uh, the prayer was really a, 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 a request of God that he would uh, restore our, our, that our relationship with him would be restored with God, with God. Yeah. So, you know, you can't have a green forest without green trees. You can't have a green tree without green leaves. And so, uh, that each of us would, would have this, uh, this renewal, this, uh, metania, this conversion, um, and then, uh, renew our relationships with one another and having, uh, renewed our relationships with one another, that, um, our nation would, uh, would be renewed and made right mm -hmm. with God and, um, our nation being made right with God. Um, we would be able to uh, make our world right with God. Uh, and uh, in this, we would find our greatness. So that, that was my prayer. It was really a prayer of conversion. Um, and uh, anyhow, so I said, my job's done. Uh, it's your job now. You have to pray for him and his safety because there are people who want to shoot him. Wow, you and said that. I said that, yeah. And uh, there Before were, the assassination. Yeah, attempt. this was about eight minutes before the wow. assassination. What, why did you, what made you think to say that? To you know, a number people? of people have asked me that. And I, uh, I'll tell you this, I'm not the kind of person who's going to go to a political rally where there are Secret Service agents and, and shout out loud, there are people who want to shoot him. Uh, but it just kind of came out of me. And I, 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 it was imprudent, yes. Uh, it was um, uh, guttural, yeah, um, but it, it came out. So um, I, 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 at that point, I thought, okay, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. So I... I uh, I headed out, and by the time I was towards the back of the towards the back of the crowd, I heard something. Didn't know. Uh, I, I never thought it would be what it was, but um, people started, you know, overtaking me, and I heard them saying, you know, it was, uh, uh, it, you know, it, it was it was a gunshot. Other people saying it was a firecracker, it was a gunshot, um, and it, at that point, just all pandemonium, you know, broke loose. It was, it was bedlam. Um, and uh, one of my parishioners who was closer up to the front at that point, you know, called me and said, yeah, it, it's real. It was in, it, he was shot in the, in the ear. And at that point there were, there were many things. And I did that interview on, on Frad's show a few hours after that 
Um, and what we were hearing was, um, I mean, that there were multiple people that were killed, that there were multiple shooters, that there were people in the crowd with guns. And uh, it was hard to know what was true and what wasn't true. And, and uh, so there's a lot, a lot of pandemonium. But uh, I remember just saying to my, my friend, on the, my parishioner on the phone and the people there, is that we were in the eye of the storm and this is a time uh, for prayer, uh, to pray for, for angelic intercession, uh, for Mr. Trump, those who were injured for, uh, for our nation. Um, and uh, so that's what we did. We just stopped and prayed. Uh, yeah. When you agreed to speak at the rally, would that, was that because you, you know, it's an invitation to pray. Would you have agreed to pray at a Democrat rally? Yes, I, mean, I what, would. Yeah, would. yeah. If if the Democrats called me to begin with a prayer, you know, I'd I, I'd say a prayer. And the reason is is that you know God, our Father, sends uh, His sunshine and His rain on the mm. good and on the bad. Mm. He's the sower that so that gets a handful of the seed and He just throws it, and some of it lands on you know fertile soil, and some of it lands on on thorns. Um, and so if if they want me to invoke. Uh, the, the name of God and to call down his, 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 his graces upon a crowd of far left Democrats, I'll do it. If they want me to do it on far right Republicans, um, you know, I, I'll do it uh, because God doesn't will that any one of these mm. should be lost. Uh, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to change the prayer. No way. So it, it's, I, I'm praying in the name of Christ. Um, and I, I, the prayer is going to be one of, of, of uh, conversion because that, that's the central message that our nation needs at this point. Um, we need uh, a prayer uh, to, to kind of uh, like a dew that just softens the, the crusty soil of our hearts mm -hmm. that we can turn back to him. As Christians, what's our responsibility when it comes to praying for even the safety potentially of our elected leaders or candidates on both sides, because I've got, of course, this is a hotly contested election. Every election is, quite frankly. But what is our what's our Christian duty and how to look at the dangers to maybe both of the candidates as well as the our responsibility to pray? Great question. From the time of the early church, the a letter of Saint Peter, you know, uh, his epistle. In there, he says, um, you know, pray, honor the honor the emperor, and uh, that's that's what we Christians have done. Is that even when you know they were um, filleting us, barbecuing us, crucifying us, feeding us to lions. Uh, we were exemplary citizens uh, under wow. the under the Roman emperors. Uh, we prayed for them, and uh, in I'm, I happen to be uh, you know a Catholic priest of, of the Eastern Church, the Ukrainian Catholic Church, and in our liturgy, we always pray for our civil authorities, those in the armed forces. You know, um, that's just part of the symphonia. You know that the American uh, consciousness has lost. Uh, we think that there's you know the reign of God, and then there's over here the civil order. That's all malarkey. You know, when you look at the Christian tradition uh, up until like last Tuesday, it was um, uh, that the the king, the government, were were uh, enacting and embodying uh, attributes of of God, God's justice, God's order, uh, God and logos, God's reason, and uh, Christians had a, a deferential uh, respect. Uh, for King, uh, even though they were sometimes absolutely crazy. Um, but God still can work through that. And we see this in, in uh, during our Lord's Passion, how the Caiaphas, the high priest that year, uh, was a kind of a wicked, deceptive man um, who was complicit in having our Lord put to death. But nevertheless, the Spirit of the Lord spoke through him, you know, because of his office. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's not a, a, a prayer for a, a president or a presidential candidate is not a, a canonization ceremony. Uh, they are in need of prayer. And I woe to that person who doesn't pray for a political leader, because um, how much do you have to hate a man mm. for the, the governance of a nation with millions of souls to be placed on his shoulder and you not to call down grace upon him and his mind, his reason, his emotions, his judgment, his will. Uh, that That's, that's, that, that's worse than hatred. I, I can't imagine someone doing that. And you're talking about Biden right now. We were to pray for oh, yeah. Biden because yeah, he yeah. has the authority now. He is in the seat. He is in the office. Yeah. Yeah. We, we pray every, every one of our liturgies. We pray for, you know, our government. And it's not like, oh, let me see in this election year if our government is, is composed of uh, God-fearing 
uh, conservatives if you're in Canada or, 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 or Republicans or what have you, is that no, governments come and go. Kings come and go. Uh, God alone remains. And his church, his bride, uh, she sails on the waters of history until uh, she will meet her, her bridegroom again. And until that time, as these kings and queens, presidents, prime ministers come and go, we nevertheless are faithful in invoking God's grace upon them. SevenWeeksCoffee.com is America's pro-life coffee company. This delicious coffee is organically farmed, it's pesticide-free, it's small batch roasted, and it's low acid. You're going to love the different blends and roasts that they have on SevenWeeksCoffee.com. But what I love about this company, besides the best cup of coffee you're going to drink, is that SevenWeeksCoffee.com gives back a full 10% of all of their revenue, not just their profits, directly to serve moms and babies in need. In fact, they have donated over 450 thousand dollars already to pregnancy resource centers to help moms and babies. And right now, through their Drink More Coffee, Save More Lives campaign, they are working to reach half a million dollars donated directly to moms and babies in need. So if you go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, you can get 15% off your order and a free tote that says Drink More Coffee, Save More Lives, helping Seven Weeks Coffee get to that half a million dollars donated. You will get a subscription to this delicious coffee. And if you use the code LILAT checkout, you'll get an additional 10% off your order for a full 25% off your first sevenweekscoffee.com order. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com to help fuel your morning with a delicious cup of coffee as well as fuel the pro-life movement and use the code Lila at checkout for a full 25% off your first order. That's Lila at checkout at sevenweekscoffee.com. Do you think that as Christians, we struggle in the West, especially the United States with perhaps being too tempted to lionize or turn into a hero, certain political candidates, and they get bitterly disappointed when they fail us? Oh, absolutely. You know, there's, um, there is a, what I would call like a, a civil religion, you know, in the United States and the uh, um, apotheosis of certain historic figures. You know, you go to the Capitol Hill in, in Washington, D.C., and you look up in the cobula there and you see the apotheosis of Washington. Um, and this kind of a, um, what do you mean by apotheosis? Apotheosis is this uh, kind of uh, exaltation into the heavenly realms of a, of a, of a man who kind of becomes un un like a god-like figure, you know. And um, of course, it's lower, but it has a pull on the national consciousness, you know. And so you see it uh, on both sides. I mean, when uh, Barack Obama was was running, you know, the press went all gaga for him, and they took these photographs of him strategically placed in front of a bright light so that there's this aura around his head, you know? Um, and uh, you see, you see this on, 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 on both sides are guilty of it, you know? Um, and, and really it's, it's a substitute for, for supernatural faith mm. because, you know, the only King that, that governs our universe is, you know, the God man, Jesus Christ. Mm. And uh, in, he, he alone is, has the solution to our problems. You know, the psalmist says, do not place your trust in the princes of men in whom there is no hope of salvation. Um, but the, the function of government, uh, you know, in, in our view as Christians, you know, is, is to execute, you know, God's um, justice. And you see this with, you know, in Romans chapter 11, with regard to uh, uh, capital punishment and whatnot. Um, and you see this um, with, with, in regard to all, all kinds of aspects of governance. Um, but... Ultimately, though, I think for us here and now, it, it's to just minimize the intrusion of of that beast, you know, government into the lives of family and churches and communities. And you want to minimize it so that uh, these pillars of, of a society can flourish. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I, that's what I see our role is, is to uh, ensure that this nation is, is true to its, its founding principles of limited government. Why? So that men can be free mm -hmm. and, and, and men can practice uh, their faith as, as their conscience dictates and they can have families that are robust and plentiful. Um, but the, the government at, at the very minimum is to secure our safety, you know, from foreign invasion and issue currency, things like that. Um, but uh, yeah. Here's what's really tough, I think, for even in what you're saying for a lot of people is that on the one hand, you have this bloated government. A lot of people are concerned that the government is too big, too powerful, too corrupt. 
you have the persecution, I think, to at least some degree of people of faith. I think about the extra measures taken against pro-life activists, as an example, by the DOJ. You have, of course, abortion, which is the worst of it all. The killing, the, the, the you know, the franchising, the killing of preborn human beings and allowing doctors or these facilities to do it freely and have protect the, the police can protect the abortionist to kill instead of the police going to protect the child from the murderer, yep. right? That's our society, the state of our society today. So you have that on the one hand. And then you have, on the other hand, the Christian duty, as you said earlier, to respect civil authority, to pray for our leaders. And you even mentioned the early Christians who would be praying for and even respecting the civil authority of the emperor when he was persecuting and killing Christians. How can you hold these two views at the same time? Well, that's, that's a great question. You know, um, th there comes a point where we, we recognize, for example, um, our father in the, and we love our father, but he's in a drunken rage and he's beating up our mother, you know? And so, uh, we don't ever, uh, kill our father because that's, you know, that's to, to dishonor, uh, a God given God instituted authority. Uh, but at a certain point when he oversteps, um, his, you know, his authority and begins to abuse it, uh, you know, the, 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 the son can step in and stay the hand of the father to protect his mother, you know? Mm -hmm. And so once uh, government over, overreaches its authority, um, our respect for that institution of authority, that, that, that um, God-given institution, uh, in this case, you know, the, the government, uh, doesn't dissipate and disappear. But uh, at that point, our, our obligation is to the greater good, namely the salvation of souls. And we are first and foremost citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem, not citizens of Washington, D.C., our first obligation is to be uh, worthy, honorable citizens of Jerusalem, of the heavenly Jerusalem. So at that point, um, we, 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 we have to recognize that uh, the governance is based upon, you know, um, the, 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 the recognition of first principles. If, and the first principles cannot be debated, you know, like the right to life. And where we are at this point is where you have, you know, legitimate government authority, that is overstepping its bounds by, as you said, uh, using the police to um, protect those who kill babies and using the police to intimidate and sometimes arrest uh, those who are protecting the innocent. So at this point, uh, we're back at the, the civil rights moment when uh, uh, churches and communities had to um, engage in conscientious objection. And this is the interesting thing is that, you know, uh, back during the civil rights era, if, if churches weren't involved, there was a lot of pressure put on like, why aren't you involved? Um, and there was no mention of, you know, uh, separation of church and state and of faith getting involved in politics, so to speak. But this is the same scenario now is that uh, we're at a, 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 at a, um, a crossroads where founding, foundational principles are no longer agreed upon, the most core foundational principles. And this is where uh, the churches should be coming out and saying uh, enough is enough. Uh, this is a time for conscientious objection. But if churches do that now, then every flag in the book is thrown at them for, for violating you know, the, um, the, the so-called separation of church and state as they interpret the Establishment Clause. Um, so you know, kind of a rambling answer, but... Uh, uh, we, we are at a point where um, the, what the government is supposed to do uh, to protect uh, its citizens, especially the most vulnerable, it's no longer doing it. And so uh, there is a parting of the ways. And in our tradition, that takes the form of conscientious objection. Um, you see that in the case of St. Thomas More. You know, uh, I am the, the king's good servant, but I'm God's first. Uh, and so that's what we have to do. We have to begin to, uh, we have to draw a line in the sand. What do you think that line should look like? I think about Joan Bell as an example. I was just at the Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis and I spoke about Joan Bell, St. Joan of Arc, my confirmation saint, and also Joan Bell, who is now 76 years old in a federal prison in the United States because of her rescue work, peaceful resistance inside abortion clinics, using her body to block the doorway so that the abortionist can't get access to kill right. human beings. Um, I know some even pro-lifers and some Christians are like, that's too much. She's not mm. obeying the law. No, I, I think that uh, the, the spirit of God is going to uh, prompt 
the sons and daughters of God uh, to begin not only speaking prophetically, but living prophetically. And uh, the history of the church is going to indicate that, I, I, the history of the church indicates that typically doesn't come from, um, you know, from, from the, the episcopacy. If you look at, um, you know, the, the Church of England during the Reformation is that the episcopacy, uh, with the exception of, of St. John Fisher, um, they folded, you know, at the moment of, of great need. Um, and, and during the French Revolution as well, a very, very few bishops uh, withstood uh, the pressure of the Jacobins. Um, and so I, I think this, as, as Fulton Sheen said, uh, this will be the moment of the laity in which um, there will be more uh, Joan Andrew Bells and uh, more people who are going to say enough is enough. Um, I, I wish I, I could give really specific examples of what that's going to look like. Um, but I, I think it's it's going to entail living radically. It's going to entail people pulling away from uh, society, which has become a sewer, and they're going to live uh, in smaller communities where they have uh, good and holy parishes. Um, and that's going to be the, uh, a sign of just living radically holy lives in, with a domestic church. Um, and um, I think more people going to prison for their, uh, for their love of Christ and the love of the holy innocents. What is the role of nonviolence in all of this? When you mentioned earlier the Christians who were under threat physically by the emperor, right? They were persecuted physically by the emperor. Would it have been just for them to defend themselves? Self-defense, I think, is most uh, Catholic and evangelical. And you know, anyone, a theologian, would say you can, of course, defend yourself. You can defend the innocent. So what's the role of self-defense? What's the role of the use of force when it comes to these matters yeah so uh, there's a difference between you know the um the the role of of those in government who have obligation for uh, uh those whom they govern and the uh, obligation of an individual christian in the face of uh, violence and threats um in the in the case of the individual uh we are to uh, i think receive the blow and it's it's in that that pressure that the lump of coal becomes a diamond and we're not going to convert the pagans. We have to recognize, we have to admit that Christendom's dead. We're, we're in a pagan society. And the only way we're going to uh, convert them is uh, as Christ converted the first pagan. It was the centurion at the cross. Only when Christ is about to expire, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The blood comes out of him. And then it's his blood that clears the blindness of the eye, the spiritual eye of that centurion who makes the confession. Truly, this was the son of God. We're no better than our, our master, you know. And so uh, the moment is coming in which uh, we too will follow the example of our Lord. And uh, when they come knocking um, is to, to go and to submit and to believe that our father will provide for us like Mark Hook, you know. Um, uh, he probably could have, you know, started pushing back uh, he submitted to this unjust, you know, gang of thugs in, you know, in, in, in government uniforms that came and dragged him away. And it was, uh, it was through that, that, uh, patience proved perfection. Uh, so that's what we're going to have to do. And, uh, you know, I think of my own church, the Ukrainian Catholic church, um, the, they proved themselves, these underground catacomb Catholics from 1946 until 1991, the largest banned religious body on planet Earth, these underground Catholics in uh, the Soviet Union. And they, they had no means to fight back. And they, they went to Siberia rather than, you know, renounce union with, with, with Rome. They weren't asked to deny, you know, the, the, the incarnation. They weren't asked to become atheists. They were simply asking, keep going, doing whatever you want. Just when you're praying, just pray for the government, Pray for the you know patriarch in, in Moscow, the Orthodox, but no, you can't pray for the Pope. And for that, they said, send us, me, my wife, our kids, you can send us to Siberia. Wow. And um, so... And what did that mean to be sent to Siberia? It meant to have your family packed up, put on a cattle train, and you were sent to Siberia. And if you were lucky, you lived by the time it arrived there. And if you got there and you were alive, what would happen to you? They had Siberia? camps, labor camps. And it, you and your family, your children are in a labor camp. Yeah. And what were conditions like in a labor camp? 
Well, um, I can ask one of my parishioners, Bodan Konetsky, who uh, um, you know was there, and they were they were there were barracks um, and uh, just pine uh, beds and uh, basic you know gruel uh, soup uh, to subsist on. Hard work in the forests, hour in the mines. Um, if uh, if it was a family, often uh, they would have little uh, villages uh, with the bare necessities. Um, so that uh, the, the kids were able to, uh, you know, live, but the parents had to, to work uh, in, in, in hard manual labor. Uh, and the, these sentences lasted anywhere from five years to, you know, 18, 20 years. Um, but the, the point of it is that uh, it was through that crucifixion that they gained the admiration and respect of wider society. Um, it, it, those who continued to you know, believe in the propped up Russian Orthodox Church controlled by the KGB, uh, those people didn't edify, you know, the pagans around them. Mm. It, you know, uh, those people were edified who were able to see the blood and the sweat and the tears of the underground Catholic Church in, in Ukraine. And when the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was their churches that were really full. And, and that's what we have to see now, is that we have to go through a very narrow window or a very narrow passage, for those of you who know anything about being splunkers and, and crawling through caves, is you have to crawl through a very narrow passage that can drive you crazy if you're, uh, um, uh, if you're afraid of tight spaces. But then you come out into a beautiful basilica-like grand room under the earth in these beautiful caverns. And that's what's awaiting us, is to go through the narrow passage. We're going to have to uh, endure some form of, of persecution. Um, and we're not going to return blows. Um, and that, that's different. I know I'm rambling a little bit, but that's different from a state. Because a state, that they have the obligation for those who cannot defend themselves, the women and the children. And, and that's, a, that's a different calculus. Um, because they can't make that choice for the three-year-old. And so for the three-year-old, for the, the woman who's breastfeeding or is pregnant, um, the state has to use its means uh, to, to repel the unjust aggressor if all other means have been ex exhausted uh, using equal force. The, um, what you're describing about the fall of the Soviet Union and the blossoming of Christianity and its fall because of those that had gone underground and kept the faith alive despite the persecution. And you're kind of talking about here, us here in the West and the United States and about how, you know, we may be required to go through some sort of a narrow passageway. I mean, certainly I think someone like Mark Hawk, you know, he was uh, praying outside an abortion clinic and then the feds showed up at his door and, and scared the living daylights out of him and his family with guns at 6 a.m. in the morning yeah. and then dragged him off to prison. I mean, insane, right? And then he was totally you know, ended up being, uh, you know, vindicated, totally vindicated because it was ridiculous yeah. what they did to him. It was persecution of a pro life yeah. person. That's what it was. And then Joan Bell, you know, she did put her body in the abortion clinic and she's doing something even more aggressive than what Mark did. She's not just on a public sidewalk. She's in an abortion yeah. facility. Yeah. Linda Gibbons in Canada and uh, mm -hmm. Mary Wagner. Mary Wagner. Yes. A hero, another hero of mine, similar, went to jail for prayer outside abortion clinics, counseling, helping women, other options. These are all examples and, and what they did, yeah, what Joan did is certainly more radical than anything I've ever done and, and perhaps you, I'm not sure, but I think about what the Christians endured in the Soviet Union. I think about what the Christians endured in Nazi Germany, especially the ones that were trying to help their Jewish brothers and sisters um, and certainly what the Jews endured. I mean, horrific what they endured. And I look at the, you know, America, you know, 21st century in America and it's like, okay, we're, we're doing pretty good. Yes. There's some persecution that's totally unacceptable pro-lifers, but really the persecution in the U.S. is of babies in the womb. Mm -hmm. They're the ones taking all the hits. Yes. Look at you and I are talking freely here on this podcast. We're going to put it up on YouTube. It's going to be fine. You know, we go about our business. Uh, the amount of persecution we endure in our day to day is there's no comparison right. to what they endured. What you were describing being sent to a labor camp in Siberia. Right. Do you think Americans maybe sometimes have a complex that we are so persecuted when we're not? Do you think there's a temptation there? 
Um, I, or do you I, think we're, we're fear, we're, it's a foreboding of something to come? What do you think is going on there? I, I think most Americans are, are blinded to the, um, the, soft, the soft form of persecution. Mm. You know, they're, they're blinded to it because of, of comfort and luxury. You know, is St. John the, the Divine, in his letter, in his epistle, he speaks about three things that bring us down, the world, the mm. flesh, and the devil. Mm. And um, the devil isn't usually going to come out and show himself for what he is. He knows that scares us, and it's going to scare us into the arms of the Blessed Mother. So uh, he lures us um, through the world and its comforts, its glamour, um, its false promises, and through the comfort of the flesh, you know, uh, sex, gluttony, ease. And so long as as we're uh, imbibing those things, uh, we're we're kind of like the you know the centurion at the cross. We just don't we don't see the gl what's before us. You're you saying know? we are the pagans. Yeah, yeah, we're 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 we're, we, we, we're, we're, we're half paganized. We're half paganized. Most most if you ask most Christians, if if, if a, a Hindu who has no idea of Jesus Christ comes up and says, "What is it you believe?" The vast majority of Christians in this country would not be able to give an Orthodox Christian answer. What is the Orthodox Christian answer? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. That's the Orthodox Christian answer. What is it, if in a nutshell, mm -hmm. that we Christians believe? God became man. Christ has died. He's risen. He'll come again. Everything is encapsulated in that. Um, but many Christians subscribe unconsciously to this uh, kind of a form of a civil religion, um, a, a moralistic deism, you know, or a therapeutic deism that God's the, the cuddly teddy bear that's there to comfort me when I when I need comforting, um, and they they they're, they're, they're very much like Mormonism in that they'll borrow uh, language of the Gospels, Trinity, salvation, Jesus Christ, grace, but the meaning has been gutted, and um, so 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 long as they're comfortable, they don't go deep, they don't go deep into. Uh, what did my forefathers believe? Um, the grace of suffering, the, the the beauty of the cross, is that it empties us of the illusion that we're something. And it forces us to cleave to Jesus Christ. And in that, we find our happiness. In that, we're, you know, we become who we've always wanted to be. But the, the constant drip of comfort and luxury and vanity... Um, is 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 like heroin to the soul. It just it it prevents us from getting down to reality. Yeah. Do you see? Do you think that current Christianity, American Christianity, Catholic, Evangelical, the whole, all of it, is too com? It's too comfortable. Oh, f oh by far and away. By how, far and how, away. how so? What are signs of that? Well, the fact is, um, people can't be in church for more than an hour. <laughs> um, a, a priest can't preach more than. 12 minutes, you know, they, they have the attention span of a gnat, you know, it, it's, uh, do you think part of that's connected to liturgy being so watered down? I think so. Like if, if you or lack of liturgical reform. Yeah. I, I think, um, as the liturgy goes, uh, so goes the society. Uh, it's the, it, it's imagine when you're in elementary school and your teacher comes in and says, you know what, you don't need to know the, um, 10 times tables anymore. You only need to know the five times tables. At, at the end of the year, how many kids are going to know the 10 times tables? Not most. You know, there'll be some keeners who will, but the, the bar has been set low and most will just go for that. And so the, the, the American experience of worship uh, over the past uh, 50 years, I'm not speaking just about Roman Catholics and Protestants, you, you name it, even independent churches, evangelical is that it's become anthropocentric, centered on man and on our entertainment needs and on our therapy, you know, uh, making us feel good. Uh, but the, the whole approach to liturgy has, has affected society because at our core, man is a liturgical animal. Um, and the approach to liturgy and worship is what am I getting out of it? But that's all, you know, bass backwards because when you go to liturgy, it's not, what you get out of it has nothing to do with it. It's what you you, what you give. Owe. It's what you. It's an. It, it's you work. Owe it, right? Yeah, you go there because liturgy, liturgia, the work of the people. You are going there to work your derriere off. 
This is our work. We And what is our work? Is that we give physical, spiritual, existential worship to God. Everything in us, we give to him during that time. And um, uh, that, that's, that's the... That's the high bar. Uh, so it's your singing. It's your you know prostrations. It's you know f- outside of Sundays. It's fasting. Um, it's going on pilgrimage. And over the 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 course of the past century and a half, uh, those here in America have slowly been uh, uh, falling away. Uh, who goes on pilgrimage anymore? We saw it in Indianapolis, and how powerful was that? We need more of that, but that's the exception. We haven't had something like that since 1940s. You know, um, yeah, it's interesting. I talked to a few people who went to the went to the Indianapolis for the Eucharistic Congress, and a few several people said the same thing. That I actually didn't want to go. It was like kind of exciting that this was happening. When push came to shove, it was like I kind of want to cancel. This is like you know, this is like a lot of work. Yeah, it, getting on a flight, a lot of work. But and they said no. I felt like I it was I owed it. I had I needed to go. Yeah, I needed to go. Yeah, for my own soul and for for God. Right. Right. And I thought that's such a refreshing way to think about instead of I'm getting something out of this conference or this event, or I'm getting something out of adoration, I'm getting something out of mass. Yeah. So I was like, what am I getting? Am I getting something? Am I getting something? You're not there to get, you're there to give. And yes, Yes. you will get because everything we have is from God. Well, C.S. Lewis had a great, a great quote. He said, you know, if you aim for heaven, you'll get that and earth thrown in. If you aim for earth, You'll get neither. You get help. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, um, or there's there's the other quote from the the soul of the apostle that that great mm. re- work is that you know if 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 priests are are saints, their people will be holy. If priests are holy, their people will be good. If if the priests are good, their people will be mediocre. If the priests are mediocre, the, the people will be evil. You know, wow. it just it just trickle down. So. We have to we have to aim higher, mm-hmm. aim higher. We have to go beyond our comfort zone, and um, we've got it so easy. I was in India uh, last month and working with Father Don Bosco, who rescues girls, Catholic girls who are sex trafficked. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's a in heart, India in India, and he gets them. How old? Oh, some some four, 13, 14, some eighteen, and these girls. I can talk about that, but it, he, he's a hero. He and the sisters with him, what they do for these girls. And some of these girls choose life. Mm. And it's going to make their life impossible. But they still choose life for the babies. And um, But I go there, and it's hot. It's muggy. It's stinky. You know, it's crowded in their churches. And they're there for a long time. They're not, they're not counting down the minutes. You know, so if if they in their pain can be in their churches for hours in the heat in the humidity of an indian summer and sing and smile and be radiant then we in our air-conditioned churches with the cushy pews we can do a little more yeah what does it look like for christians in the united states to how should christians in the united states think about this election that is um, very complicated. Um, we have to realize that, you know, our, our one true home is heaven. And uh, there's always the diabolical temptation to raw power. There's always the diabolical temptation uh, to make, um, that we're going to make heaven here on earth. Isn't that the Lord's Prayer, though, to some degree? It, well, this is the counter argument, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, we're, Thy we're, will be done on earth. Right. as it is in heaven, and our job is to build the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. The difference comes down to the, 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 the will, is that I'm not doing my will. I'm doing his will. And insofar as uh, his prompting and legitimate authority confirms how I'm to live out that will, I do it. With the, kind of the Machiavellian model, is that this is my vision of what it's going to look like, and I will do it. And so it's, there's, there's no external higher authority that is rubbing up against your will. Um, and uh, so that, that's, that's the key difference. I mean, both want to do something good, supposedly. Um, one is, is checked uh, against, against the divine will. Yeah. 
Well, what are you referring to there exactly, though? I think about, as a, an example, Protestant Christians who say, well, the Holy Bible gave me this inspiration, or I follow the Bible, and you know, I believe that God commissioned Donald Trump to save the United States from the evils that be, you know, the, the pro-abortion, anti-life, anti-this, anti-that, you know, corrupt Democratic Party. And so Trump's not perfect, but kind of like, you know, Constantine, God is using him. And so, you know, we have a responsibility to back Donald Trump. So I think there is a biblical, there can be a biblical justification for that. I think there can be. Um, but I think it comes with uh, some caveats. You know, there, there is, like in Isaiah 45, we see that you have the uh, very fallible uh, pagan ruler, uh, Darius, who is, um, oh, sorry, not Darius, Isaiah 45. Um, uh, yeah, Darius, who is used by God, and he is said to be Yahweh's Messiah, you know. And so God uses him uh, for, for a good end. And the same is with like uh, in, in Numbers, uh, I forget, Numbers 12 maybe, with Barlam's ass, the donkey, that God uses this man, uh, this man's donkey for, for prophetic utterance. And God can do that with, with anyone he chooses. And I think, you know, last Saturday uh, is, is a sign that, that God is willing to use uh, his human instruments here, in this case, uh, Donald Trump, uh, to accomplish a good purpose. But now here's the, the flip side of it <clears throat> is that he has to cooperate with that. And there, there are lots of examples in history, like you think of King Saul, uh, whose, hand, whose life was altered by the hand of God that came upon him and showed favor to him uh, through, through Samuel the prophet and through other signs. Yet Saul, in his pride, uh, spoiled it. Hmm. Uh, and you can use the same with with um, you know many examples in Scripture. So I think with with uh, Donald Trump, uh, it's possible that God's using him. I think the sign that he was uh, saved from a bullet w within millimeters cannot just be uh, dismissed out of hand. Uh, but it comes with a caveat that if that is the hand of God, then great things are expected of you, and and woe to the ruler who takes that as a, as, a, as a canonization of everything. It should be a reminder of humility and to get right with God and to submit to God's plan. Uh, so here in the United States, we have a problem. And that problem is that we expect of our political process uh, dogmatic authority and purity, while our churches are hesitant to even clearly affirm the most basic of doctrines. And this is the paradox. So like we look at the, the Republican platform, you know, they've stepped back on, on the issue of life in, um, in compared to what it was. And uh, people are upset about that. And I think there's some measure of justification for that. But at the same time, they're treating it like it's a creed or they're treating, they're, they're, they're expecting from a political party and their platform um, a, a level of dogma that that the church should be providing and this is this is the the purview of the church is that the church needs to be prophetic the church needs to provide uh the the, the proclamation of life um and when a when a when a when a political party uh shies away from it for for reasons of political advantage uh people get upset they should be more upset with their churches who for 50 years have refused to proclaim boldly the sanctity of life in the womb. And it's because of that failure to be prophetic and bold on the sanctity of life for the past generation that it trickles down to our political parties. We, we can't expect our political parties to be more prophetic than the Church of Christ. Okay, I have a number of things to ask about what you just said. Yeah. It bubbles up a lot of questions. So, <laughs> and maybe people listening are thinking of some of these questions. Back to Joe Biden, President Biden, still president as of this recording, yeah. although who knows what's going to happen next with, week. I mean, gosh, right? But, or Kamala Harris, for that matter, if she ends up taking over the presidency because Joe steps down and President Biden steps down, whatever. You said God can use anyone. You gave examples of God using... You know, Cyrus. It was Cyrus. It wasn't Cyrus, Darius. Yes, yeah. the Cyrus mantle. That's, Cyrus, that, yeah. That, yes, not Darius. Cyrus. But anyways, do you think God... I mean, Joe Biden's a baptized Catholic. Do you think God was like, I'll use you, Joe. I'll use you. Look at these opportunities I'm giving you. Yeah. You're now the president of the United States. I will use you, Joe Biden. Stand up for life, stand up for yes. marriage, stand up for truth. 
And he just says, no, I'm, I'm peace out. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the dark side, basically. Like yeah. God gave that choice to Joe Biden as much as he's going to give it to Trump. Yep. So back to Trump then for a minute. Um, it's not like God specifically favors the Republicans versus the Democrats because of something in history. It's like he's going to give any man in any office the opportunity to do the good or woman for that matter. I believe that uh, so, to some he gives greater opportunities. Okay. But as far as the opportunity of being president of the United States. Yes. So with President Trump, you mentioned the Republican Party platform and, you know, people have been upset that it's been weakened, although not as many people as I would hope. There actually a lot of people are just saying, buckle up, we're backing Trump no matter what. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when you, it's Trump versus Kamala Harris, I get that, right? And I'm speaking my personal capacity here. Obviously, mm -hmm. live action doesn't take, you know, back city candidate, but we're a not for profit. But as a personally, yeah, it's clear Kamala Harris's record on abortion yeah. versus Donald Trump's. Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, absolutely more pro abortion. That's right. crystal clear. It's also clear and profoundly disappointing that President Trump is kind of positioning himself as this leader of the the right, you could say, Republicans, including the pro-life community. And he changed the platform through his own pressure that was, for 40 years was pro-life and it no longer is. And for 40 years was pro-marriage and it no longer is. And, you know, people were upset as they should be because this is the candidate that wants their votes, right. you know? And they're told when they're upset, how, how dare you be upset? Look how bad the opposition is. Plus I gave you the overturning of Roe v. Wade. You owe it to me. Don't, don't be upset. You might, you know, uh, you might suppress the vote for me. Mm -hmm. So how dare you guys be upset? In fact, there's one far right, uh, Catholic kind of trad commentator who wrote in, in an article saying how it was, I'll just say peachy Keenan. Um, she wrote in an article how uh, asking for uh, the pro-life platform to go back into the Republican party platform is like a toddler asking for too much ice cream. Mm. What, what is your take on that? Yeah. Well, I know that was a long question there, but. Right. Yeah. As I said, the psalmist says, you know, we, we don't place our hope in the princes of men and there's no salvation in the princes of men. Uh, so at best, I think what we Christians can hope for in this world, uh, because we're always going to have affl affliction and trouble in this world. At best, what we can hope for is a government that minimizes its intrusions into the life of the church, into the life of the domestic church, and in the, the basic natural goods of providing for your family. And so, uh, you know, when it comes, if, if you don't have the ultimate, the, the, the greater good placed before you, and you have to choose between uh, bad and really, really bad, then you have to you know, choose the lesser evil. Um, and I think in this case, it's pretty clear that people of conscience, uh, Christians of conscience and conviction, uh, simply uh, cannot go before God and say they knowingly vote for, um, you know, Joe Biden or, or Kamala Harris, knowing that they are explicitly endorsing abortion. Whereas the alternative is uh, un unfavorable. Uh, it's really a pr now a pro-choice party, um, but it is um, a, a party that is, is going to, um, at this point, minimize uh, intrusion into the, the, uh, domestic church and the life of the church. And, and hopefully that creates some, some breathing room so that we can become saints and we can raise our kids in the fear of, of God. Um, but I, I think that, uh, we Catholics do ourselves no favors by, by settling for, uh, the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. Well, at least we have a party that gives us a seat at the table. Um, if that's the case, um, I think we, we just better, you know, um, move to um, Newfoundland or, or, or you know, St. Pierre uh, de Michelon out in the Atlantic Ocean. We have to be engaged in the process. We can't tune out. Um, and one of the, the issues from history that I, I like to point to is the history during the Russian Revolution is that, you know, the, the leading up to the Russian Revolution, you had the Tsar and the, 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 the Tsar and his powers were called, the, their, his army were called the Whites. And they, they were brutal to um, uh, religious minorities, Ukrainian Catholics, um, and uh, to Ukrainians. Um, and when the revolution came, there were a lot of people who so hated uh, the Tsar that they, they, gave, they gave their support to the Reds and the led to the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and we know how that ended up, you know, with, with uh, atheistic Marxism taking over... Um, Whole, vast, vast swaths of, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the earth. So, um, it was out of their, their 
dislike for the czar that they they refused to to back him um and and greater Their dislike evil, of the whites of the whites yeah and because of that we had the bolshevik success so i think that uh there is a danger in that uh we can so dislike um what you know what what the um the re, the republican platform has become that we can disengage and if we do that you know uh they get two votes mm -hmm. you know for uh, for every pro life vote that stays home the democrats actually get uh the pro, the 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 pro abortion vote gets two um when so much of our society today and our culture is politicized and politics i would argue in some ways is sort of like a reigning religion in a way yeah. you know what people believe and how they align politically has kind of become their worldview it's not like they are catholic and then they vote this way it's like they are republican maga or yes. they are you know you know blue collar or just like hardcore left democrat whatever it is and that sort of informs their whole you know at least much of their worldview and even their operational behavior too or at least it's closely aligned uh in that case what does it look like then for everyday people that are needing to like you said vote for the lesser of two evils effectively here and you're saying to stay home is kind of a giving an extra vote to the democrats here but you also don't want to make some sort of a cultural statement that the religion of maga so to speak mm -hmm. the religion of the republican pat platform if we'll call it that for what how people kind of see this is a good one right Th this like, is how do we do that how, how do you because i've been criticized i'll just say i've been heavily criticized for daring to even say trump is not Trump's platform is not pro-life. Yeah. J.D. Vance just endorsed abortion pills, right. which commit over half of a, half of all abortions today. 60%. Killing, yeah, 60% yeah, of babies today. And he said he's fine with them. Yeah. And this is a Catholic man. I actually want to address that first. I know I'm dumping a bunch of questions on you here, but let's start with that. J.D. Vance is a Catholic convert. I w a young man just asked me this at a conference recently. He said, I want to run for office. I'm feeling called to run for politics. Any advice for me? And I said, do not lose your soul mm -hmm. for the sake of a political, a, a seat of power. And what I mean by that is if you are a Catholic man, you can't go out and say, I support abortion pills, even if you're going to be the president of the United States and get to do a bunch right. of good, theoretically. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's the... Um, so what does the, I guess, sorry to interrupt, but the question here would be the first question. What is the prophetic, what does the prophetic witness of the Christian look like right now? when you're dealing with the realities of what's happening in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Yeah, it, it's to, uh, I think, to affirm the Lordship of Christ. That's, that's the first thing, is that uh, Christ's Lordship is first and foremost, whether you're uh, a governor or whether you're governed, is that uh, we're under, under Christ. Um, and I, I think the second thing is for them to uh, to, to affirm uh, the sanctity of life, and because uh, everything is predicated on that that primordial right to life, uh, so I think the prophetic uh, response of the church in this time is um, is, ex is 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 mega make excommunication great again, and that I, I, it sounds funny, but I it, it's true is that that. Um, um, tool is medicinal it is there for a reason it's there to say especially to people catholics who are in the public in the public eye to say that you're causing scandal you're causing disgrace to the name of christ and you're undermining the gospel by either affirming explicit you know uh, theological heresy or uh by vi but causing scandal by by taking the life of of the unborn and uh supporting that so uh, they need to be called uh, on the carpet. And I think what's happened is that uh, there's now a precedence been set because you have the, the Mario Cuomo's of the 1980s, who uh, these public Catholics who um, said, I'm personally opposed, but then they went ahead and they, they affirmed in their political offices um, abortion. And um, we Catholics rightly, you know, urge the bishops and, and to, to no avail uh, to, to, to discipline men like that because it caused scandal. Um, so we have to be consistent and prophetic and hold our own camp to that same standard. And uh, say that about J.D. Vance is that, um, you know, you make a claim to be Catholic. Now, this doesn't apply to Donald Trump because he's never made, you know, a claim to be Catholic in his first administration. He does claim to be Christian, though. 
Right, but I, I'm, I'm speaking yeah. as a prophetic uh, response as, as a Catholic. I, I can okay. work within my own camp. Mm-hmm. Is that um, you claim to be Catholic, and uh, yet you you support, in, in effect, 60% of abortions in the country. And so uh, there, there needs to be a public reckoning. And that's something that uh, is is incumbent upon the hierarchy of the church. Mm-hmm. You you can't do it. I can't do it. And uh, this is this is the um, the role of the church of the hierarchy of the church. If they if they do it, I think there's they, there's tremendous spiritual power in holy orders, mm-hmm. and I think it's going to lead to a you know a renewal of the land. If they don't do it, then the trees continue to wilt and they continue to die. Um, but there needs to be a prophetic and bold calling of of JD Vance. You've made a profession of faith. You've become a Catholic. Uh, you did affirm life for many years, but now, uh, whether it's with IVF or with uh, uh, the the, uh, the 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 Mifeprestone, uh, you've affirmed something that we, as people of life who worship Jesus Christ, we cannot let that go on. We Heart Nutrition is the highest quality research back ingredients in beautiful vitamin packages for your health. We Heart Nutrition crafts packages of vitamins specifically for every woman at every stage of their life. So they have your everyday multivitamin for women, they have your prenatal vitamin for women, they have your maximizing your body for fertility package, they have your postnatal package, your premenopausal package, your postmenopausal package. And what's so wonderful about weheartnutrition.com is that this is all sourced in the United States with the highest quality ingredients and that all the ingredients are in their most bio-identical form for the easiest absorption into your body. I love We Heart Nutrition because it's not just a best-in-class product, but this is a company based in the United States run by a small family business that is 100% pro-life. And in fact, WeHeartNutrition.com is donating 10% of all of their sales directly back to the pro-life movement to support moms and babies in need through the Pregnancy Center movement. You're going to love WeHeartNutrition.com because it's an amazing product. It's going to help you be healthier. And you're also going to know that you're partnering with a company that shares your values and that generously donates 10% back of all sales to the pro-life movement. So go to weheartnutrition.com today, put in your order for vitamins for whatever stage of life you are at, and use the code LILA at checkout for a full 20% off your order. That's weheartnutrition.com. Use the code LILA at checkout for 20% off your order. And by the way, if for whatever reason you don't like the product, it's not working for you, there is a full 60-day back guarantee that you can return the product, no questions asked in 60 days, and you can get a full refund. So there's no reason why not. Check out weheartnutrition.com today and use the code LILA at checkout for 20% off your order. I agree with you. I mean, I think about Nancy Pelosi and the Archbishop of San Francisco, uh, uh, Cordelione, being very prophetic and saying, you cannot receive Holy Communion in my diocese. Mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi is a a passionate defender of abortion, as you know. Uh, And people saying you should not, you know, Joe Biden shouldn't, you know, the Pope's meeting with Joe Biden, very upset about the Pope for that. Although, you know, the Pope in that scenario, it wasn't clear the Pope was blessing Joe Biden's actions for abortion, of course, to meet with someone uh, isn't to endorse them as a candidate, of course. Um, I've met with abortionists and I've debated them and that doesn't mean I'm endorsing them. Now, people will say, well, did the Pope debate Joe Biden? Did he even bring it up? You know, I wasn't in the room. I don't know. But I bring this up because... You're saying it's up to the bishops, it's up to the you know the the our priest to be prophetic in calling out moral uh, disorder. Right? You could say J.D. Vance right now promoting abortion as a Catholic. Nancy Pelosi it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. Right, doesn't, doesn't matter. matter if it's an election or not. If you do this, there's a consequence. But the lay people have a role too, <laughs> right? And you know I feel personally called to speak more, the truth more about these moral issues day in and day out, whether it's popular or not, as winsomely as possible. And, you know, back to the fact that we are dealing with an election, we're dealing with, you know, a not so great candidate and a potentially really bad candidate, right? But there's still this, I think, sensitivity where that's kind of the tribal thing where, well, if you criticize our guy, even though he's not as good, you know, even though he's sorry, he's even though he's not perfect, but he's better than the other guy. If you even criticize him, even if you're calling out the flaws that are true flaws, like they're pro-abortion in this way, then you are damaging the opportunity to win in this election because people are going to stay home. Well, I think the, um, the, the most, there is such a thing called loyal opposition, you know, and, and people who, who speak uh, with conviction and uh, their voice and their weight uh, carries tremendous weight down, down the line. 
down the road. Um, and we can be, you know, temporarily popular or, and, or sorry, temporarily hated and, and in the long term respected. And uh, I think that's the, that's the better option than being um, uh, popular in the short term and then shown to be uh, lacking wisdom in the long term. Uh, I, I think that with Trump, though, the, um, you know, when, when he was running in 2016, he was given a list and, um, from various pro-life organizations, and he returned it to them and he added things to it. Uh, his record, uh, I think, goes to his credit. Um, I think that perhaps what's happening now is more of a political calculus uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to get more votes. I, I personally think that you need, to, um, you, you, you need to adhere proudly and, and f- vociferously to the foundational principles. Um, but I, I think that uh, I'm just trying to get inside their head what they're thinking and I think they're, they're just, they're, there's a political calculus going on yeah. that's unfortunate. And at, at times like this, uh, we don't need to back away. We need to, to, uh, to be more present. Uh, I know there's that tendency to say, well, it's the, it's the unpure thing. I don't want any of the contagion. I'm not mm-hmm. going to engage it. And the opposite has to happen mm-hmm. is we have to lean in even more and we have to make the case for freedom, uh, for life and for love. Um, and, um, unfortunately I think the, we're at this place because people within the Republican party who don't share our values, I think of log cabin Republicans, uh, they've been uh, at the grindstone for, for a number of years and we've become a little complacent. And so now is the time that we just need to, uh, uh, to, to double up the efforts and to uh, make our case even stronger. Um, My concern there is if the way to win loyalty to Trump, and I know this personally because I was asked to endorse him in the past. I never have, uh, not because I don't think he's better than Biden because he clearly is, Mm. and I would vote for him over Biden, um, but because the condition of the endorsement, and this is kind of known in the MAGA world, is you cannot say a word of loyal opposition. You have to just lockstep, he's our guy. Mm. And I think the, and I can understand why politically it makes sense you know, to your point, politically, mm-hmm. you can make all kinds of sense out of all kinds of things for any number of compromises that are profoundly immoral. And I could argue they're also unwise, but, you know, that's an argument. But I think that's where, uh, you know, the role of the Christian in today's election, right, coming back to that, and the role of prophetic, being a prophetic voice, despite the unpopularity of that, and despite the consequences of that. Right. Again, a lot of Christians, I think, are feeling like I just got to shuffle and get in line because, you know, the big Democrat Sauron is on the move and I can't, you know, Trump was good in 2020 for, for us. Uh, you know, he was, or sorry, he was good up till 2020 for us. And so even though he's saying all this stuff that's crazy now, we're going to get in line because we trust that it's going to be okay. And yeah. we're not going to criticize him because we don't want to suppress the vote. But the everyday American looking at that calculus you know, remember, this is more than an election. We're talking about the heart and soul yeah. of the people are looking at that calculus and saying, you you guys, here you claim you're so pro-life, here you claim you're pro-marriage, you claim you're Catholic, you claim you're Christian, and you're going hard for Donald Trump and refusing to criticize a, an iota of what he does Yeah, because of the election. Do you, yeah. do you see what I'm saying? And, we and, lose and the it, prophetic witness. It, it's going to come back uh, and bite us. So you think of, mm-hmm. for example, um, you know, I use the example of the Soviet Union, is that um, the Russian Orthodox Church has zero credibility. You know, they, they have a nice pomp and, and circumstance and pomp and circus, but they have zero credibility. Why? Because when they were living under the thumb of Stalin, they rubber stamped everything he did. Wow. You know, and, and so when Stalin dies and the Soviet Union a few decades later dies, uh, there's, n- there's no, there's no, there's nothing there. You know, you're, you're empty, mm. you know? Um, and so the same as you know, we run that risk as well is that if we uh, only speak conviction when it's convenient or when it's the other tribe or we'll bash Joe Biden right, for this, but then, not but, our guy. Right. Then we don't have our guy. We don't have prophetic uh, voice and our children will not will not respect us. And most importantly, the Lord will say, get away from me. I never knew you. You know, um, so I have two, two responses is, first of all, this country, you know, our, our first of all. We, our allegiance is to Christ, and and that has to be stressed. Uh, so often, you know, clergy will speak about the natural law, the natural law, the natural law. You were not ordained for the natural law. You were ordained 
to save souls. Mm. And that is why we are here, is to save souls. And everything that we have in this time and space, the political institutions, social institutions, are there merely as aids uh, for men and women uh, to become holy. The sacraments are here sacramentally, spiritually, to help us become holy. So that's our first focus. Uh, as citizens, though, we don't take an oath. This country is unique. I, I come originally from Canada. You know, we take an oath to the Queen. And most countries in the world, I think all countries except this one, they take an oath to, uh, a, you know, a president, to a prime minister, to a king, to a queen. This country is unique. We don't do that. When, when you take an oath in this country, let's say you're a federal judge, you take an oath to a document, not to a person, you know? So your oath is to the Constitution. So anything that would... Um, is that weird? It, well, not really, because um, I think it presupposes in its founding that most of those who, who constituted the governing class, those who were in governance, were, were God-fearing people. And they, 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 they presuppose that they already were in the service of, of, of God. Um, but in terms of the civil or ordering of life, is that uh, this document embodies principles without which the nation cannot be governed. So in, in one sense, I, I, think it's, I think it's ingenious, is that you're, you're taking a, an oath uh, to, to, to execute uh, you know, the, 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 the principles held in a, in a, in a constitution, in a document. It, it's, it's pretty amazing because persons can change. This is, a, this is static. It doesn't change. Mm -hmm. If I take an oath to the queen and the queen says, you know, I jump off um, the, the chair and land on one leg, uh, okay, but the, the, the document is static. You know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't vary. Um, and the second point to that, to your question is that we cannot simply be uh, reactive based on fear. We act not upon the fear of what can be, but upon the love of what is. And, and that is the grace of God at work in us through the incarnation of Christ. And uh, that, that is what, that's what motivates us. And so what's happened is that we've become un, we've become unmoored from our principles uh, through fear of how big the enemy is, uh, and and that that's that's in counter counter witness to the example of David. You know, David goes up against Goliath, and everyone's afraid. Everyone's afraid in the Israeli camp, except David. Why? You know, because the others came up and they saw how big Goliath was. David came in and he said, he said how big his God is. And, and that, that's the difference. So we, we have a, a movement, I think, in, in uh, the conservative circles that is so bitter and so angry with what the, the transgender movement has done to the natural family. And rightfully so. They're, they're, they're angry because that's an evil. Uh, they're so bad, mad with what they've done to our schools, to our Boy Scouts, to all of these beautiful uh, institutions in our society uh, to culture in general, you know, uh, le leftism is like, you know, acid on skin. It's, it, it's corrosive that now they want payback. They want blood. And my concern is that it's not guided by uh, the perennial principles that have come down to us uh, from, from the church. It's just, it's, 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 it's guided by animosity and vitriol. Mm -hmm. And then if that's the case, if our animating principle is vitriol, then we've become the enemy, you know. We, we've we've become a mirror image of them. We're their clone. The names might be different, but the animating principle is the same, um, and we can't allow that to happen. I, you know, one, one example I, I saw this. I, I wrote about this in the Post Gazette in Pittsburgh. Um, is that when when the war happened, you had uh, a lot of uh, confusion of alliances with Ukraine the, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. All of a sudden, you think people who would support because conservatives under the Reagan era were, you know, supporting Ukraine uh, and Ukrainian causes against, you know, uh, the brutality of the Russians. And then all of a sudden now what ha began happening um, two years ago are all of a sudden the conservatives were taking the side of Russia. And I, I, I noticed that their, their, their positioning was not based on principles. It was based on vindictiveness. Is that, well, it's my enemy's enemy, hmm. so I'm not going to... 
Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to align with them. Um, and their 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 um, moral reasoning was devoid of anything that the church has given us. And now that because that wasn't called out, a uh, violation of what I think is the the church's perennial just war theory. Because that wasn't called out, the drip down effect is now here with you know the case of J.D. Vance is that well he's no longer following the perennial principles on life. He he's not following it on the issue of just war theory and the protection of life for those who cannot defend themselves in Ukraine, and he's not using that's those same perennial princi- uh, principles when it comes to the preborn uh, through the use of of the morning after pill. Uh, so we have become. Uh, largely, uh, the conservatives. Uh, unfortunately, there are many of us who have uh, been so um, uh, upset with the direction of our culture, with what the, the left has done to our culture, to our border, to our our, our our society, that we've adopted their unprincipled animosity. All right, I really want to unpack with the time we have left Ukraine, because we I, I knew we were going to talk about that. You have a very important perspective on it. And we haven't talked about it that much on the podcast yet. But before that, you talked about the vitriolic response that some may have in so much anger at the acidity, use the idea of acid dripping on skin, which I think is actually a, you know, powerful image. And I I can see that culturally, how acidic some of these ideologies are that are so, you know, turning the natural order on its head and destroying the family, destroying life, destroying marriage, all of these things, destroying human sexuality. What is, how does one discern in one's own heart and then in, in our action, because sometimes our heart can deceive us, how can one discern, okay, this is born out of uh, the vitriol, fear, fearful anger against this foe that's destroying culture versus, Leftism, you mean. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or any other, you can put, put any other, you know, right. bad ideology there. Uh, and righteous anger. Righteous anger, which should motivate us to take courageous action on behalf of the good, the true, the beautiful. Because they can maybe look a little bit the same sometimes. Maybe they can even, people might feel that they're the same sometimes. Yeah. So are you asking this in, in relation to Ukraine? No. no. Let's, I want to go to Ukraine in a moment. I'm asking in relation to the kind of the culture wars, the political battles. Hmm. How do we as Christians discern the difference between that angry, um, Anger is not even the right word because you can have righteous anger. So we're not going to even use that word here in the negative. Rage. Rage. I mean, sure. Although you can there be righteous rage. I don't know. Maybe there can't. No, there can't be. Okay. Well, educate us here. How does one personally and in their action and their words ensure that they are not being motivated by the vitriol and hate, quite frankly, versus righteous anger? Yeah. And how should we also discern it in other people that we're choosing to follow as leaders? This is also very important because I think we're always looking for leaders influencers, political candidates, thought leaders, whatever. And how can we help discern it in other people? Is this a, is this righteous anger or is yeah. this So you ask help vitriol. to discern it. So yeah, you have to speak uh, to yourself in practical terms here. Uh, when you're correcting someone, uh, that person, would you be willing to cross the street and um, forgive that person? Would you make an effort to cross the street and embrace that person? Um, and and wish them well. And if you can say yes to that, then whatever it is you're feeling is probably righteous anger. See, because what, what you're feeling is not uh, contrary to that person because you still have um, a fraternal loving sentiment towards that person. Uh, what we need is, is to know, what we need to know is this, is that... Um, Anger, God kind of permits that passion in us uh, so that we can do battle with Satan, so that we can do battle with evil, so that we would we would hate evil, sin. Um, and if we have that um, uh, that that anger against that thing that's causing my sister to harm herself, that's righteous. But if we feel and perceive that 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 direction that um kind of uh, um, um um flow i guess you use the word that that volcanic flow coming out of you isn't directed against the virus that's held her soul hostage but it's directed against her then that is sinful so that that's the difference is it directed against the virus 
that is holding her hostage, that's, that's, that's contaminated her mind, her will, her desires, and you just want to expunge that from her and you, you want to hold her, that's good. But if it's directed against uh, the person and you have desire to uh, harm the person, uh, to humiliate them, um, then that's an indication that it's not righteous. In some cases, there's a virus, like you said, that might need to be expunged. expunged. You know, maybe an ideological, the woke mind virus is the, mm -hmm. the famous Musk God said, yeah. sod uh, phrase, I think, than Elon Musk. But, you know, there's also just free will and people choose to make choices. And sometimes they know what they're doing and they still choose to do what is wrong. Yeah. In that case, you can have righteous anger against that person. No. Like the abortionist who says, yeah. I know it's a baby and yeah. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. I'm making money. Yeah. Yeah. So that that tool of righteous anger, first of all, uh, it, it can't be um, longstanding. Mm. If if righteous anger is longstanding, then it's not righteous. Um, and and that, is that from the, even the, the Lord's wrath is just for a moment? Well, there's that, but then there's also, I think it's um, uh, Peter who says um, um, that when, you know, the, the, the um, if you're, I can't remember the exact verse, but in Peter's letter, he speaks about the wrath that that's righteous anger, mm. but it by 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 sundown you have to mm. let it go. So um, it, righteous anger is specific, mm. and it's not in, it's not enduring. Mm. If, if it's enduring and you're keeping it warm in your breast, then it, it it's mm. it, it's passionate, but it's not righteous. Mm. It's, it's passionate anger, not righteous anger. So that that is, um, uh, I think, a good segue in in terms of of um, where we are in in the pro life battle here in America. Is that there are people who so hate what uh, the abortionists are doing that it's become um, um, unchristian. I just want to stop what they're doing, but it's not it's not just stop the evil that they're doing. Do you want to save their souls? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and and that that's that that's the critical distinction. Is that is that the responsibility of the Christian? I was talking to a wise, um, you know, I think priest about this, and you know, if if a child is about to be murdered on the street, you're running to rescue that child, right? And the man murdering that child, you care for that man's soul, but the child's the one being well, it's, killed, it's immediate, right? Yeah. So in that sense, you know, I, I would say sometimes in the public movement, we're not angry enough. Mm. We don't care enough. Joan Bell, she cares. Mm. Do I care enough? Do yeah. we care enough? You know? And so in a way we have yeah. to stir the fires yes, of righteous right. anger. Because if anything, I would say like back to your point earlier about being comfortable, we are so comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I agree. We're, we're not, we're not angry enough by the slaughter of the innocents. And uh, um, at that anger though is, it, it has to be directed to a spiritual end. And, uh, and that, that's, that's what, you know that's what I, I I very much believe that the the healing of the nation, the healing of these wounds, uh, the rebuilding of a culture of life at its core, um, it's not it's not a legal solution, it's not um, a political solution, it's not a cultural solution. All of those law, politics, culture, they're all downstream from the liturgical, and we need to make reparation to God on behalf of our nation for this. Uh, uh, form of demon worship. It's Moloch worship. Mm. At its core, this isn't a social or a medical phenomenon. It is, um, we've fallen back into the, the trap of our forefathers, the Israelites, who worshipped Moloch. And the, the, the proof and the price of that worship is to pass your children through the fire. And so at its core, this anger that we, we, we feel, and, and it kind of percolates in us, it has to be directed to the ultimate evil, which is the, Lucifer, and um, all of his 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 plans to destroy us, and especially children, because children are icons of God in their innocence and beauty. So we always have to uh, uh, direct this back against the evil one, and pray. You know the Psalms of imprecation. We have to pray the Saint Michael prayer. We have to make sure that our house is, is in order, uh, that we are doing the work of God and we're, we're, we're reciting uh, the Psalms, we're reciting prayers of, of uh, deliverance because that's what we're facing right now. It's, it's an attack of the demonic and 
abortion is merely a liturgical symptom of disordered worship of Moloch. Before you go, I need to ask you about Ukraine. You have a very unique perspective, Father. You're married to a Ukrainian woman, it's my understanding, and you've mm -hmm. spent time in that part of the world. Yeah. And a lot of people on the right right now say that Zelensky is a puppet put in place by effectively the CIA. This is kind of the argument from like the Tucker Carlson space. And that, you know, we, this is not the, the truly the freely chosen by the Ukrainian people, that a lot of Ukrainian is actually Russian, and that we sort of created this, um, this government effectively, or we helped create it. And that now by us funneling money into Ukraine, we are basically sending good, you know, young Ukrainian men just to, right into the jaws of the lion just to be killed one after the next because Putin's not going to relent. And so why are we funding these foreign wars? Well, there's um, one, one problem with that is that the people who are invested in this, who actually live there, who speak the language, uh, who are losing their sons and daughters, uh, they, they know more about that than, uh, you know, the average American sitting on their couch here reading conspiracy theories from, uh, um, from extreme websites that are funneled, handed information from uh, the FSB, this, the, the, the Russian uh, uh, secret police and their propaganda arm. Um, we have to realize that this is a war, it's kinetic, involving missiles, but it's also propagandistic. And it's, it's striving to influence the minds of the public in the greatest superpower in the world right now, because this greatest superpower is giving missiles and armaments and uh, bullets uh, to Ukraine. So Russia realizes that it has a two-front war. It has to uh, change American public opinion because that will change the deliverance of, um, of, of uh, armaments. And so what we're hearing from, uh, I'll, 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 I'll name it like LifeSite News, mm -hmm. uh, are, are uh, gross uh, distortions of the actual uh, reality in Ukraine. It's, it's not true. Um, I think what is true, what is true is that, uh, Russia is going through, uh, a population implosion because of abortion. Uh, the average in some parts of Russia, the average number of abortions per woman is 12. Wow. Okay. The average in some regions of Russia is 12, which means some of them have had 17, 18 abortions. I spoke when I lived there, I, 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 I spoke to many women and that's just their contraception is, um, and they, they, they speak openly about it often. Um, and so what, what, what happened is that Mark Stein in 2006 wrote a book called America Alone. And uh, he prophetically said that because of this contraceptive abortive, uh, abortive mentality in, uh, in Russia, uh, they're, they will never be able to exist as a nation unless they very quickly fix their population problem by invading their neighbors and recouping populations. So you think Putin wants to invade Ukraine because they're not having enough babies in Russia? Yeah. It's, it's all math. Wow. It's all math. But he's not going to come out and say, you know, uh, we're, we're dying as a nation. Are the Ukrainians having a lot of babies? No. No, it, They're that also whole, struggling. It, w w once the people breathe the air of socialism, they give up on reproducing. You know, so it, it it's it's this that whole sphere. It is, uh, you know, Bulgaria. You know, the um, all the eastern the uh, countries that were in the Iron Curtain have just they've given up on on reproducing. But Putin um, still wants because I think the concern among those that support the war in Ukraine in terms of supporting Ukraine. It's well, you know, if Putin goes and invades Ukraine, who's next? You know, he's, yeah. he's like the reestablishment of the Soviet Union. What's going on here? Right. Just re annexing Ukraine. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the principle we have to work at with here is, for example, I like to draw historical parallels with Poland. You know, Poland was ruled by um, uh, a series of puppets mm -hmm. leading up to the Second World War. Um, and they were uh, followers of the, the deceased strongman. And um, many of them were Masons. Uh, they were socialists, but uh, the people were, were God-fearing. And Germany invaded, no justification for it. And at that, 
the West gets involved. Not because Poland had a great economic um, offer that it could give to the West, but simply because of a question of just war, is that this is un un untenable. You can't be doing this. The same thing is happening with Ukraine. And, and the and what you're saying there, if I understand you correctly, is that the the people we allied with to defeat the Nazis were not all these great liberty loving no. pro life people. You we're allying at one point with the Soviets. I mean, we're allying we, with they allied, and they, they gave them um, unbelievable amounts of armaments. Like so, the the same people that were going to eventually send Christians to the Gulag are the no, people had already had sent already Christians. excuse me had already sent Christians to the Gulag. We are marching arm in arm with effectively to defeat the Nazis. Yes, yes. And the socialists and the Masons in Poland, we we came to their defense simply on a matter of justice because what the Nazis were doing was wrong. Now, But then we sustained a Cold War, right? I mean, it, once, we, once we defeated Nazi Germany, it's not like we were all buddy-buddy with the Soviets. Yeah, yeah, but I, I'm speaking about the Poles. Yeah, okay. okay so so the, yeah. the Poles, the, the people were Catholic. They weren't aligned with Moscow. They weren't aligned with Nazi Germany, um, but they were invaded by Nazi Germany. And at that, like England says, we're going to war with you. And um, m the parallel I'm drawing is that uh, the, the government in Ukraine is imperfect. I admit it. I, I mean, Zelensky appointed uh, Maria Abramovich, who is into the occult and um, all kinds of things that are, are just horrible. Um, but that is no reason to violate uh, the just war theory, is that the people have a right to self-defense and they're in that position because of us. Because of us, they gave up their nuclear weapons. They had the third largest arsenal of nuclear weapons on the planet. Ukraine. Ukraine, yeah. People don't know this. Tucker Carlson never speaks about it. They had the third largest and they voluntarily, well, under pressure from Washington, D.C., in 1994, uh, they, they gave them up and they gave them to Russia on the condition that the UK, France, and the United States would defend Ukraine's territorial integrity, but Ukraine had to give up their ballistic missiles and their nuclear missiles. And so Ukraine just came through the winter of atheistic communism. And they said, hey, if the West is gonna be our friend, we don't wanna, of course we'll do it. We don't want anything to do with Russia. And so they did that. And then a few years later, in 1998, Russia signs an agreement with Ukraine that they will honor their borders. Okay, so then wh why, did, why did Russia invade? Why did Russia invade? It wasn't as though Ukraine had sent missiles across the border or anything like that. It's unprovoked and it's contrary to how Christian nations, as Russia claims it's you know, uh, supposedly a bastion of, of Christian civilization, that it's, on, it's contrary to how they, they, they uh, relate with one another. So this has nothing to do with an imperfect government in, 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 in Ukraine. We have an imperfect government. Does that mean that it's okay if Mexico invades us? Well, no. Uh, well, okay, we have an imperfect government um, and the, you know, there are bad actors there. And therefore, if Mexico invades, well, these same people, they're going to say, well, let's just let Mexico do it. No, of course not. It's, it's stupid to say that. It is. It does seem contradictory how some of these folks can really blast other foreign leaders and also blast our leader, but then say America is the best. Yeah, it's all so convoluted. It's, it's, it, it sort of contradicts itself. It, it's all convoluted. You have my fellow conservatives who want a secure border here, okay? Uh, they want a secure border and they want to secure the right to life in the womb. The, the left, the left, they don't care about life in the womb and they don't care about the border. Now, let's, let's change the script. Let's say we're talking about Ukraine. All of a sudden, <laughs> the conservatives don't care about their border and they don't care about all the babies that are dying from the Russian missiles that are not targeting government institutions. They're targeting hospitals, kindergartens, schools, residential buildings. They don't care about that. There's not a tear shed by Tucker Carlson on that. He's a heartless beast. You know, he needs to repent. He'll never see the light of heaven, Dr. Carlson. He will never see the light of heaven because he's a liar. He has no interest in defending the innocent, God's little children. And he's used his platform to deceive and to serve the father of lies. So by uh, defending Russia, by defending Russia, who is violating the sanctity of life across borders and what it does in the womb. It, it, it's it's the, the 
you have no country in the world has more abortions than, than Russia. And that's not brought up. Uh, but all of a sudden, the left, for their part, all of a sudden, the left is, is concerned about Ukraine's borders. That's sacrosanct. And every time you hear that a Russian missile hits uh, a maternity ward in Kiev, it's on CNN, you know. But, okay, that's horrible. I'm, I, it breaks me apart when I hear about all these babies that die in, with these missile attacks at maternity wards in Ukraine. It, anger, it, it angers me. But we have the equivalent of about, what, 500 of that happening every day in this country. 2,800 abor abortions in, in America you every know? day. So we're all unprincipled. Well, they both, mm -hmm. not, both sides of this political mess, have they've gone cuckoo. They've lost their marbles. They've lost the founding principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what your political opinions are. doesn't matter who you are. You have an inviolate gift, and that's called life, and it's sacred. And it doesn't matter what your nationality is, what your political opinions are. That is sacred. And I must lay my life down to defend and protect you. But the left and the right, uh, have they're in, in a, a danger zone of completely abandoning those first principles. What do you think is the proper response of the United States with the war in Ukraine? And is the war winnable against Putin and Russia? Yeah, I think the, the proper uh, response is uh, what Trump is doing. Trump has has the magic sauce in this and he hasn't got the credit that he deserves mm. is his specifics. And uh, he's, he, he spoke about a white paper that was given mm. to him in which um, he said that he'll threaten to uh, you know give to Ukraine all the weapons at once if Russia doesn't begin to get serious about real, real peace. Mm. And then he, he also threatened Ukraine that he'll mm. withdraw, um, you know, withdraw weapons if, if, if Ukraine isn't serious about peace. Uh, and I, I hope that doesn't mean, you know, giving up uh, territory like mm. uh, Zaporizhia and the south of Ukraine. But this is the magic sauce is that uh, he, he has an exit strategy. It's hasn't been laid out very clearly, but he says within, I think he said 24 hours was his kind of his claim. But he said that he will give Ukraine more, more weapons unless there is uh, a specific real peace that, that's put on the table. Um, so I think we need to have a deadline. Father, this has been so illuminating. We got to have you back on because there's so much more we could have talked about in addition to what we already discussed. But I do want you to share briefly about the shrine, that project that you're doing. You mentioned it. I think you referenced it earlier, but would love to hear about it. The shrine for the unborn. Yeah, thank you. You know, Jesus begins his mission with the words, repent, repent, mm -hmm. repent. Everything begins with repenting, turning around and being being made new again. And our nation needs renewal. We need a revival. We need a revival of turning back to God. And uh, it requires work. It requires effort. And it requires it, that it be liturgical. So um, we need to raise an altar uh, to make reparation to God for our uh, ingratitude, the, the murder of at least 65 million little baby boys and girls. Um, you know, you cannot, you cannot uh, spit in the face of God and kill 65 million children and expect us to walk through the flowers. You can't do that. A nation like that is under judgment. And the only way that a nation under judgment can be made right and be made great is to humbly admit their mistakes, to go to confession, as it were. And uh, traditionally, that means from the time of Abel, Elijah, Moses, down through the early Christians, that's taken the form of raising a holy altar, a place that's visible, tangible, and holy, where sacrifices can be made to God. And for we Christians, there is no sacrifice greater than the unbloody sacrifice of the Holy Eucharist offered at that place specifically, exclusively, for reparation for our sin of idolatry. Because that, uh, Lila, is what abortion is. It is an act of idolatry to Moloch and Baal. That's what we are guilty of. Our nation has fallen in to the sin of Israel of old, of what worshiping Moloch. So uh, it's a place to first make reparation, but it's also a place, once we've done that, to go through that narrow passage and come out and we have a beautiful place of thanksgiving where anyone and everyone of, of goodwill can come and to give thanks to God for this great nation, to give thanks to God for the gift of the family he gave you, the gift of uh, the children he gave you. And it's a place of remembrance where um, these uh, children will be remembered uh, in, their, in their millions um, from throughout the country. It'll be a place also where pro-lifers can gather um, and it'll be a place of pilgrimage where people can do what our forefathers used to do in Europe 
and go on pilgrimages for days and uh, finish it by walking through the crawling through the eye of the needle to come up into a, the, one of the most beautiful churches in America. It won't be the largest, but it'll be the most beautiful dedicated to Mary, uh, she who is our protectress. Um, and it'll be a place finally where we will put on display for the whole country uh, the corporal works of mercy, a place where mothers in distress, uh, mothers who are kicked out of their home and have nowhere to go with their kids, mothers who've chosen life uh, and have been abandoned uh, by their boyfriends, where they will be welcomed and they'll be loved back into life. Mm -hmm so that we're not just against abortion. Uh, we're for mother and child, and this is going to be their little Bethany home. Beautiful. Where will this be? It'll be outside of Pittsburgh. Beautiful. Yep. Thank you so and much, the, Father. The website is holyprotectionshrine.org. Uh, one of the inspirations for it was F, was uh, Sacre-Cœur Basilica in Paris when France had abandoned the faith and you know spilled blood all over Europe. It was one holy man who said we need to raise a holy altar in reparation mm. for the sins of our nation and to call our people back to their moral excellence they once possessed. And he did that by building that. The year they agreed to build it was the year that St. Therese of Lisieux was born, mm. and it changed the course of uh, history. And mm. so if God can see this same willingness to sacrifice on our part to raise a holy altar, he's going to bless us with a future St. Therese of Lisieux here in America. Uh, so visit Holy protectionshrine.org. Amazing. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Really interesting stuff. I hope we have Father Sharon back on the show again. Uh, I'm sure you guys have thoughts. Let me know in the comments. Let me know in an email, lila at gtbmedia.com. I love hearing from you. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you listen and send this to a friend that helps the show reach more people. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time. And a huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest Catholic network in the world, reaching millions with entertainment, news, and more. Check them out at EWTN.com.